Okay, so welcome to the uh, Friday Gal Sit uh, seminar. Uh, today, uh, oh, I should introduce myself first. I'm Dale Pullen. I'm a faculty member in uh, aerospace at Caltech. Um, today we have um, Voda Mostert. Uh, Voda did his uh, undergraduate and PhD work at the University of Queensland in Mechanical Engineering. His PhD advisor was Vincent Wheatley, he's also a, a Galsit alum. Uh, he worked on the uh, magneto hydrodynamic Rickmeyer Meshkoff uh, instability. He then uh, came to Caltech and worked with me on the stability of shock waves in uh, both neutral gases and magneto hydrodynamics. Uh, he then moved to Princeton, where he worked with Professor Luke. Dikey on numerical simulation of breaking waves, and he's recently moved to the Missouri University of Science and Technology, where he is an assistant professor. And he's now going to talk today on uh, numerical simulation of bubbles, droplets in and dissipation in breaking waves. So away you go, Voda. Thanks very much for the introduction, uh, sir, and uh, uh, thank you everybody for coming to my talk uh, today. Um, let me just uh, bring up my, my slide here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and I must say it is a real pleasure and a, and, a, and a privilege to be back here again at Caltech, even if virtually, um, to, to uh, see you all again, talk to you all again, and to show you some of the work that I have been doing over the last couple of years. Um, so I will be talking to you about, uh, this is work that um, I, a lot of this work I did at uh, Princeton, um, and that I will, I'm uh, continuing with a lot of this work at um, uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology, or Missouri s and and I'll be talking to you about um, these bubbles, droplets, and energy dissipation in breaking ocean waves. So um, the, here, I'll begin with an outline of what I want to tell you today. I'll, I want to first uh, um, help uh, set up the motivation and, and understanding of why these problems are important, why we care about them. Um, I'll then talk about uh, the work that I do. I do numerical work and uh, I will describe to you the approach that I take and why I take it. Um, and then I will outline a, uh, some specific results um, that have come out of this research in the last few years, which I think is very interesting. I hope, I hope you think so too, uh, before we conclude the talk. So, breaking waves, why do we care? Well, um, as we know, the ocean and the atmosphere are two huge parts of the Earth system and they how they communicate is a big, uh, a big part of how the climate evolves and how it, uh, the dynamics of the climate and um, trying to understand these communication mechanics between the ocean and the atmosphere um, is very important if we really want to understand, um, if we want to be able to model the climate and to understand the impacts of climate change um, as, as time moves forward. Um, and so, it's, it's true that the ocean and the atmosphere that communicate at the surface, uh, the surface of the ocean, this is the interface between these two, or one of the interfaces between these two giant bodies of fluid. And there is a lot of um, forms that this communication takes. There's momentum flux, energy flux, and mass flux. And as we know, waves are ubiquitous over the surface of the ocean. And not only are waves ubiquitous, but also breaking waves. And we know, um, at least qualitatively, that these waves and these breaking waves will influence and modulate the, the transfer of these quantities between ocean and atmosphere. But unfortunately, the role of breaking waves remains really, really incompletely understood in how um, these, these uh, in terms of quantifying these fluxes between ocean and atmosphere. So I want to spend a couple of slides to uh, elaborate a little bit on what I mean by these, uh, these transfers of quantities. Um, so to begin with, I want to point out that deep wave breaking mediates energy transfer between ocean and atmosphere. So here I show you an overhead view of the ocean showing lots of breaking waves. Um, and if we zoom in on one of these waves, uh, this is now metaphorically zooming in in the, uh, in the laboratory. This is from a recent study by Drazen, Melville and Linane. And we look at, at how this, waves, this wave breaks we see that as the wave breaks, it forms, it ingests a lot of air and it ejects a lot of water into the air above. And in doing so, it also forms this turbulent cloud um, that, that develops underneath the surface of the, of, the, of the wave as the wave is breaking. And so this, 
This turbulent zone involves a lot of uh, energy dissipation, and it is one of the ways in which surface waves dissipate energy that they've built up over many kilometers of wind wave interaction. And then as they break, this, uh, this generation of this turbulent cloud um, helps interact with subsurface currents underneath the surface, and it can contribute to mixing in the upper ocean. And I want to really emphasize that this is essentially a turbulent multiphase flow problem. When a wave breaks, we can't really separate the multiphaseness from the turbulence-ness. They are really uh, bound up together quite closely. Uh, this is in deep water. Uh, you can also make uh, the case that energy transfer is very uh, important in shallow water breaking. Of course, from the uh, human habitation point of view, uh, we care about energies of breaking waves and how they dissipate them because these breaking waves can impact on walls and structures and generate very large peak pressures um, and flow velocities that can damage or, dis or, or even destroy these structures. Um, and so being able to understand how these waves uh, um, dissipate their energy when they break, um, for example, onto these structures is an important, at least an important engineering problem from a, from a civil engineering perspective. But also as a natural process, uh, shallow water wave dynamics can strongly influence erosion and sediment transport. What I have here at the bottom is an aerial view of Silver Strand, which is a beach in San Diego. Um, and the, the, colored, the colored contour shows the change in elevation, which was attained on this beach before and after the 2015-2016 El Nino event. As you can see, um, the action of the, of, of the Coastal, the coastal wave systems on this beach over that time had induced a three, up to a three meter drop in, in, in the elevation of this beach and clearly through erosion and sediment transport processes. So understanding shallow water uh, energetic, uh, energetics of waves um, is part of the problem of understanding how uh, sediment transport and uh, erosion processes can occur. So much for energy, what about mass transfer? I did mention this. Um, if we go back to this experimental uh, image of this wave breaking, really the most obvious thing that we see, um, apart from the spray being generated, is that there is a lot of bubbles that is ingested underneath the wave. And this is in, included or inside and bound up with the turbulent cloud that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here is an, uh, an image from another experiment. This is due to Dean and Stokes in the 2002 Nature paper, uh, where you can very clearly see the very large population of, of bubbles that is formed underneath the wave as it, as it, um, as it breaks. And uh, these bubbles are, are very much caught up in, the, in this, uh, this turbulent zone underneath the wave. Um, this is very important for us because, of course, as air gets entrained into the water by breaking waves, uh, this is one of the me uh, mechanisms by which uh, atmospheric CO2, which, has, which had been anthropogenically emitted, um, can be taken up by the ocean. Up to 40% of the uptake by the ocean is done through bubble entrainment, you know, due to a re recent study by Reichel and Dyker, 2020. Um, and so it's very clear that this, these entrainment processes, they en enhance the gas transfer from ocean to atmosphere, sorry, atmosphere to ocean. Um, and it is, uh, it is once again a, a very much a turbulent multiphase problem. Again, you, we can't really separate uh, these, two, these two concepts of the turbulence and the multiphase. And then of course, we also have spray generation. And spray is a particularly challenging problem because uh, when waves break, there are so many sources of, of spray in the breaking process. So here's a schematic diagram from a review by Veron in 2015. Which shows, um, which shows this breaking wave. And one mechanism by which we can get spray is that if we're in very high wind conditions, or even if the phase speed of the wave is very high, we can have um, small droplets that are torn from the surface of the water, um, forming spume. Uh, these are, are, uh, this is one way by which spray can be generated. Another way is, of course, that the wave overturns and splashes, creating spray. This is a very familiar process. Um, and then another way is that through all that air that's being entrained as bubbles, a lot of those bubbles can then rise to the surface and burst, forming jet drops or film droplets. And even the physics there varies between these two kinds of droplets that are emitted. So we have all these different kinds of ways by which spray can be emitted uh, by breaking waves. And all of this spray um, constitutes uh, what we call sea spray aerosol. And of course, uh, this is a, a large, uh, a very big problem in understanding um, say, for example, uh, aerosol cloud interactions 
Um, sea spray aerosol can uh, influence cloud seeding and nucleation processes. Um, at the nanometric scale, there's a chemistry of aerosols that, that, um, that is a very active research topic. Uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, it's, it's very important to understand the statistics of the spray that is generated by these breaking processes. This is sort of the key question that, or one of the key questions that, uh, that sort of envelops or encompasses this question of sprays that how do size distributions and the statistics of the droplets arise from wave breaking. And once again, this is a turbulent multi-phase flow problem, especially really on the multi-phase, sorry, the multi-phase flow part of this, um, of this breaking process. So I hope I've convinced you that it's a, that this whole issue of breaking waves is a, is a challenging uh, physical scenario. Uh, so how can we go about uh, finding an approach to start solving some problems here? So this is where I want to talk to you about the way that I go about it. I do numerical modeling. Um, and in order to do a, an effective job at this, we really need to understand the various scales of the processes going on in breaking waves. So let's take that same experimental image of this breaking wave. And we see that this wave has a wavelength of say on the order of a meter as it was in the experiment here. Um, and let's look at all the processes that are happening in here. Um, first, there's this viscous boundary layer, which is on the order of a millimeter, depending on the Reynolds number of the wave. Um, and so if we want to understand this problem, we want to understand this viscous boundary layer. Of course, there's this turbulent cloud in the middle here, and we care about the Kolmogorov scales as well. Um, if we look at the mass and this, uh, sorry, the, the mass transfer questions, uh, we have bubble statistics here. And so here is uh, data from this Dean and Stokes experimental paper, which shows bubbles uh, showing up from on the, around the order of 10 millimeters down to the down to 100 microns, maybe a little bit less than uh, order of 100 microns. Um, if we look at the spray, another recent experimental paper uh, shows uh, droplets that can form from one millimeter down to the order of tens of microns. And of course, droplets can be generated that go all the way down to the nanometric scale where we start worrying about chemistry of aerosols. So in just this one slide, we've spanned nine orders of magnitude in our length scales. And of course, above the wavelength scale, there will be other physics like wave-wave interactions and the larger wave spectrum and the wave field that we want to worry about. So this is, no approach can hope to resolve all of these scales. Certainly no numerical approach can, can hope to do this. So we have to be picky about where in these scales we want to um, do our meaningful analysis. Um, so numerically, there are a couple of approaches that we can take. On the oceanographic side, um, we can use regional models, which really care about what is happening at the large scale. So these are from 10 meters up to hundreds of kilometers. We care really, you know, on, on, on the geometry of shelves and I suppose shelves and, um, and, and really large scale terrain of the earth. Um, and these models are very good at what happens at these large scales. Um, but uh, in order to get any sort of meaningful information at the small scales, they have to use parameterized models. And a lot of these, these models are based on observation or, or experiment, which uh, are not always physically informed. They may be based on a certain statistics and empirical fittings obtained from observation, as I say. Another approach you can take is, is large eddy simulation or large eddy simulation type approaches where really they try and uh, resolve what is happening at the wave structure and maybe multiple waves can be resolved. What's happening at the very large scale may be resolved or it may be abstracted in some sense. So we make assumptions about what's happening outside of our resolved domain. Um, but they still also at the smaller scales uh, may use some kind of parameterization, for example, subgrid turbulence models. And in multi-phase flow in particular, they might use, they might assume size distributions for bubbles and droplet statistics. Um, and then of course, the third approach is a, a direct numerical simulation approach, a DNS approach. This is the approach that, uh, that I adopt. And the, and the idea here is that we really just try and resolve everything that's happening at the small scales and get a clear understanding of the physics at these smallest scales. Uh, the downside is that you have to abstract what is happening at the larger scales. You really, uh, you, there's no choice, you have to do that. Uh, but what you can do is uh, by getting the, this physical information at these small, small scales, if you can understand what is going on and develop physical arguments for them, you can develop scaling arguments for them and therefore scaling models, which you might be able to um, import into these larger scale models and then improve their subgrid um, modeling and their subgrid parameterizations. And uh, that is really what I want to do. I want to make 
these guys life easier by giving them better parameterizations at the small scales. Um, so, so if I'm uh, using this approach, how do I do it? What tool do I use? Uh, so right now I am using a tool called Basilisk. This is actually a library of, um, of different codes, well, of, of different solver types. I'm solving the two-phase Navier-Stokes equations with surface tension. And really the, I would say the key feature of this code is its uh, use of adaptive mesh refinement. So what I have here on the right is a video of a breaking wave. This is a cross section through the wave where I'm col coloring the contour map is, is colored by local resolution. So warm colors are high resolution, cool colors are low resolution. And the idea is that where the flow is mostly quiescent, we don't really waste computational resources, but where there's a lot of action, that's where we deliver the resolution. And so this, what this helps us to do is it, it, it allows us to get very large effective resolutions, very large resolutions, uh, equivalent conventional resolutions, but at much reduced costs. Um, this allows us to handle this multi-scale nature of this problem a little bit more easily um, and get uh, in, in, the, in some cases here that I present today up to effective resolutions of uh, 2000 cubed cells in, in a domain for a conventional grid. Uh, by comparison, the, the grid sizes that I attain reach maybe 350 million cells. So that is a, quite a large reduction in, in, in grid size at, at least um, in, in looking at these problems. And I'll show you what we can what we can do with this kind of code. Here is a rendering of a three-dimensional breaking wave, starting off as a planar wave. Um, and I want to, you can see it turn overturning and splashing, creating all these droplets in the air and all these bubbles in the water below. And I am just going to emphasize that all of these droplets and bubbles are resolved directly by the code. We make no assumptions about the statistics of these bubbles and droplets. In fact, the whole idea is that we generate statistics. Uh, from data sets like this that will help us understand the physics um, under, uh, you know, underlying a lot of the, uh, these mass transfer and, and energy transfer processes. So I want to now move on to some key results and um, to, to show you some of the things that, um, that can be achieved with this approach. Um, but to start with, before we get into the, the heavy duty three-dimensional waves, let's start with a simple system, a model, well, it's, not necessarily simple, but it is a model system that helps us uh, then understand what, what, what goes on as we move on to the more uh, in uh, sort of complicated and involved uh, three-dimensional calculations. So let's think about a breaking wave. This, is, uh, this argument is from, that I'm about to present is from a study in 2009, experimental study. Um, let's look at this breaking wave. And this wave um, steepens and then eventually it overturns and it forms a jet, which which uh, overturns and plunges, uh, uh, forming a cavity here. And as it plunges, it attains a velocity w, and it plunges over a height h. And then uh, as it breaks, it forms this turbulent cloud in the water with a length scale l um, and across a, an effective cross-sectional area a. We want to discuss the energy dissipation rate inside this cloud. So let's just say that the dissipation rate in the cloud is given by this classic scaling. Uh, where chi is a proportionality constant, w is a characteristic velocity, and l is a characteristic length. These are the, uh, the scales, these are the quantities at the integral length scales. Um, if we, we need a good way to estimate what these two characteristic scales are, and it actually turns out to be quite easy to estimate them. The velocity you can estimate as merely being the ballistic velocity that the jet attains as it drops through this height h, and then the characteristic length scale is just the height h, the idea being that as the wave breaks, it then projects a distance of h uh, down underneath the water, and then that forms, that sets the, large, the largest eddies inside this turbulent cloud. And then you estimate the turbulent cross-section as being proportional to the square of that length scale. Um, in a, you, could, you could argue, you could think of it as uh, saying that uh, this turbulent cross-section is an expression of the available volume of water which is going to enter and to constitute this turbulent cloud. Um, and then so using this we can estimate a dissipation rate in the wave per unit length. Um, so per unit length of the breaking of the crest of the wave as it breaks, uh, where rho is the density, a is the cross-sectional area, and epsilon is the dissipation rate that we just estimated before. And doing this, it is possible to understand the dissipation at, this, uh, at the subwave scale. And in fact, this result uh, was then subsequently used uh, in incorporating into uh, regional wave models uh, in two papers that I cite here. I wanted to develop a similar model, but for shallow water breakers. 
So let's set up a shallow water breaking wave system. Uh, we start with a solitary wave, which has a height h0, traveling over an undisturbed depth of d0. And then eventually it encounters a beach, which has a uniform slope of angle theta, which is sufficiently small. So we say that it's uh, approximately equal to its own tangent. Um, and then eventually this wave undergoes nonlinear steepening and it reaches a breaking point, which is the point where this interface on the front of the wave becomes vertical. That's how we define it here. Um, and then at that point, it has a breaking height HB and is over an undisturbed depth DB. Um, let's see what this looks like. I'm gonna do some two dimensional simulations. This here is a camera on top that's following the wave and at the bottom it's fixed uh, on the beach. And then as the wave overturns, it splashes creating a lot of uh, dissipation. Um, and the, the color is vorticity by the way. And the wave runs up the beach, reaches a maximum inshore extent, comes back down in a drawdown phase and then uh, there's this interesting little secondary breaking event that happens right at the end here. I'll play you that, that first video again, especially from the wave perspective. The wave approaches the beach. Here's the beach coming up from the bottom. The wave steepens. It eventually overturns and breaks, splashes, and runs up the beach. We can separate or divide this process into four phases. First phase is this uh, approach phase where the interface is single valued and exhibits nonlinear wave steepening. Eventually it steepens to the point where it overturns and the interface becomes multi-valued and we form a breaker, a plunging or spilling. I'll talk more about this in a moment. Um, bubbles and droplets are physically generated during this process, but we don't care quite so much about it in this analysis. And there's a lot of energy dissipation that occurs uh, during this time. Uh, this phase then gradually transitions into this run-up phase where the wave goes up onto the beach. It reaches its maximum inshore extent and then it enters this terminal, I guess, phase, uh, which is the drawdown phase, where the wave retreats back to the ocean. Uh, what are the different kinds of waves that we can get from this? Um, we are varying the two parameters, the slope of the beach and the height of the wave. Um, so at very uh, shallow slopes and small waves, we get spilling breakers. And a spilling breaker is one where you see the wave doesn't really properly overturn, or, or rather it overturns and it doesn't form a cavity underneath. It um, it, it just it spills and it breaks down across its own front surface. Um, as we increase the slope of the beach and the height of the wave, uh, we start to get plunging breakers where we get a proper cavity that's developing there and a real jet that is projecting forward into the water. Um, if we increase further, we get stronger plunging breakers, so higher jet velocities, so there's stronger, um, stronger impact, until at some point the breaker actually starts to impinge directly onto the beach in front of it. And at this point, it sort of ceases to be a plunging breaker and we start calling it a collapsing breaker because it's just sort of falling onto the beach. Um, and then at the very highest slopes and really high slopes and at any amplitude really you get these surging breakers. And so these waves don't really overturn in, in the same way that the other waves do. In fact, they just, I mean, they surge. I don't really know another good way to, to put it. They just run up the beach like this. Um, and so I'm really interested in looking at the energy dissipation rates in these waves as they break. Um, so to do that, I look at the energy budget. So the energy budget is made up of the volume integrated kinetic energy in the liquid phase and the volume integrated gravitational potential energy in the liquid phase. And I add the two together and this gives the conservative mechanical energy. Um, and so we plot this over time. This is time normalized by the linear phase speed in shallow water. Um, and we see that we can actually identify the four, four phases of the wave's evolution on this plot. We have phase one, which is this approach phase here, where we see just a little bit of dissipation of the wave's energy due to um, the action of viscous boundary layer, both underneath the surface of the wave and at the seabed. Uh, but then the wave eventually breaks and sees a dramatic decrease in its energy. Um, and and uh, this occurs between these points that I've marked EB and E2. Uh, this is where we see the most intense dissipation of energy and this really is what we characterize as um, as uh, the second phase and then it transitions to this point where the uh, gravitational potential energy decreases and the kinetic and it, and it, sorry uh, the gravitational energy increases the kinetic energy decreases which looks like the run-up we can see that the wave is approaching a maximum inshore extent before it then begins to run back down the beach and that's the fourth phase so i'm really interested in the second phase here so we can isolate this active breaking phase within the energy budget, and we can actually estimate the volumetric dissipation rate inside the water during this time. This is a very straightforward process. We just 
fit a, a linear curve uh, to the energy budget between here and we estimate it as the rise over run. That gives us an estimate for the dissipation rate. And of course, we've, we've done simulations like this for each of these slopes and each of these amplitudes. And so if we compile them all, we get a data set and a data set that shows trends. We see trends that suggest that the uh, normalized energy dissipation rate increases with the breaking amplitude of the wave. And we see also that there is clearly an effect from changing the slope of the beach on the, um, on the dissipation rate of the wave. We have these, we have these trends, it, it makes a nice line, but we don't actually have a model to explain the data. All we have is data and we can identify the trends, but we can't really quantify them. So can we develop a model that explains this data? Um, and so to do this, I, wanted, I, I went back and looked at the Drazen model that I described to you a short while ago, where they identify these characteristic scales in the breaking wave. So we can do the same thing. We have a wave that overturns, except that it's now a shallow water case. Uh, how does the process change for this? Well, we can assume a turbulent dissipation rate, epsilon, uh, with this characteristic velocity w and a characteristic length l, and we want to find out how to choose those two quantities that reflects the physical reality of this problem. Um, we can uh, it, we can actually take our first cue from Drazen very easily by just assuming that the wave, that this jet attains its ballist, uh, a ballistic velo velocity as it impacts on the water in front, um, depending on the breaking height HB of the wave. But we see that because, especially if HB is larger than dB, if the wave is very high relative to the local depth, uh, we see that when the wave breaks, it isn't able to attain eddy sizes that are larger than the local depth. That means that the local depth sets an upper limit on the eddy sizes that can form, and so therefore is a very convenient estimate for us for this integral length scale. And then large, uh, lastly, rather, the size of the turbulent zone can be estimated again according to uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the breaking wave, because I argue that um, it's the amplitude of the breaking wave that sets the volume of water that will constitute this dissipative cloud. Once we put all of these estimates into our uh, definition of um, the dissipation rate per unit length of breaking crest, we get a scaling that scales as the breaking height of the wave to the 712 divided by the local depth of the, uh, of the water at breaking. And so if we uh, use this to try and scale our data, we do actually see a very nice collapse of all of our numerical data. Um, what I'm doing here is plotting uh, epsilon L times local depth um, as a function of a power law of HB. Um, and I get a dashed line with an exponent of 3.2 here, which is not too far from the 3.5, which is um, expected from the theory. And so this is a, a model that actually very nicely explains um, the, the numerical data that we've gathered here and, um, and forms a simple model for us. And so this is exactly the kind of uh, model that I want to then take and then supply to, to larger scale models. So that's that's great. I felt very good about this, but there's actually a question that you may have thought of by now is that all of these simulations I just performed were two-dimensional simulations. But then I made a lot of arguments that were based on the turbulence that develops underneath the surface. Um, and then I tested this against two-dimensional data. But we know that uh, turbulence is an essentially three-dimensional process and that when waves break, of course, waves break in a very three-dimensional manner. Um, so how can we how do I, how can we account for this? How can we investigate this a little bit, a little bit more? And so to answer this question a little, little bit, um, uh, to look at this question in a little more detail, I decided, well, why not just do a direct comparison between 3D waves and 2D waves? And to, so to do this, I apologize for the, for the, um, the choppiness of these videos. My laptop is uh, just barely able to manage them, but you can see that this is a visualization of the breaking wave viewed from the top on the left, and from the bottom on the right. Um, the, uh, you can see especially that there is a wealth of bubbles that is generated by the breaking wave on the right and a lot of droplets generated on the left. And of course we know it's not so clear in these videos, but we know that there's a lot of energy that is dissipated during this process. And what I want to do is a direct comparison between the 3D and, and the equivalent 2D problem. I want to emphasize that these 3D waves start off as 2D waves, but then they overturn and break and then they rapidly become three-dimensional. Um, and so we can then do a direct comparison of the evolution of the dissipation rates between the three-dimensional and the two-dimensional cases. So if we just do a, uh, oh, but before I continue further, I just want to, I'm gonna be talking about a couple of non-dimensional numbers here. And I just want to make sure we're on the same page 
um, I will be talking about the bond number of these waves. This is a measure of the relative effects of the buoyant and the surface tension effects. Um, and typically larger bond numbers correspond to longer wavelength waves. Um, and the other, the other number that I'm going to talk about is of course the Reynolds number. This is the wave Reynolds number where the length scales are on the, on the, wave, on the, on the wave scale. Um, and I'll be discussing Reynolds number 40,000, 100,000. Also actually be showing some 10,000 Reynolds number cases as well. I will also be making some reference to the numerical resolution that I'm using according to the effective grid, res grid resolution as a power of two. Um, and all these variables here are outlined at the bottom here. Um, so let's do a direct comparison for a bond, bond number of 500. This is a wavelength of about 40 centimeters in, for air and water um, at a quite a low Reynolds number. This is a very viscous wave. Let's do a comparison directly of this energy budget. Remember, this is the same energy budget that I was, or the same kind of energy budget that I was just talking about with shallow water breakers and compare the evolution of the 2D and the 3D. So we see at early times, both waves steepen and then there comes a point where they both break. And then we notice that for much of the evolution time, the 2D and the 3D budgets look very similar to each other and they diverge a little bit later on, but even aside from that divergence, they behave quite similarly. And if we fit a curve to this, it would have a very similar slope between the two cases. Um, the, by the way, the time normalization here is on the period of the wave. Um, if we then increase the Reynolds number of the wave tenfold, and we look at the same budget, uh, we see that there is some agreement between the two waves very early on in the, in the evolution, but they actually diverge a lot earlier in the process. Um, it's still interesting though, that on the whole, uh, they, they, they match reasonably close, closely if you, if you, you know, fit a curve to these. But it is clear, however, that there is a Reynolds number effect in how well these two curves will agree with each other and when this divergence point occurs. So why and how is this so? Um, can we get some insight into this? So to answer this question, I looked at the energy dissipation rate. So this is the energy dissipation rate integrated over the volume of the liquid phase. Um, this is given by um, the volume integral of the sum of the squares of the deformation tensor terms. And here I am doing explicit summation over all of the indices of the deformation tensor. You can manipulate this so that you can express the energy dissipation rate merely as the sum of uh, a set of nine contributions in 3D. And each of these contributions can be expressed as a volume integral of the square of the deformation tensor terms. Um, in Cartesian coordinates, we can separate, we, we can group these terms rather, according to those terms which are vertical and, and streamwise of the breaking wave, and those terms which involve any spanwise component of the breaking wave. So in our 2D simulations, we only have these in-plane contributions, but in our 3D simulations, we also have these out-of-plane contributions. And so we can sum over these uh, contributions into two groups. Uh, that is, we can group our energy dissipation rate into a sum of the in-plane and the out-of-plane contributions. Of course, I have numerical data, which means I have uh, full information about this at all times in my simulation. So we can actually look at our energy dissipation rates. Let's look at our very viscous case. This is a low Reynolds number. Um, uh, and we look at the dissipation rate. The solid blue line is the total three-dimensional dissipation. The purple line is the in-plane contribution to the 3D, to the full 3D. And the green is the out-of-plane contribution. For reference, I also have the two-dimensional dissipation rate from, that is from the two-dimensional simulations. And as we can see that for this low Reynolds number case, we see very, very good agreement between our 3D and our 2D dissipation rates for, for most of the duration of the breaking process. There is a, a clear difference um, at, at, at 1.5 wave periods here. Um, but the other really interesting feature here is that the out of plane contribution to the dissipation rate is very small for a very large chunk of this, um, of this active breaking period. And that the in plane contribution really dominates uh, the 3D dissipation rate um, at these early times. Um, if we then increase the, the Reynolds number by a lot, tenfold increase, uh, we see that this phenomenon actually no, is clearly no longer true at this very high Reynolds number. And we see uh, that the out of plane contribution grows pretty much immediately. Um, and that immediately we see this divergence of the three dimensional dissipation rate from the two dimensional dissipation rate. I also point out that interestingly, the in plane and out of plane contributions match uh, very, very well numerically, especially later on in the, sim the simulation. Um, so there's clearly a process here, which is um, 
which is Reynolds number dependent and higher Reynolds numbers promote a faster out of plane contribution growth um, in our three dimensional uh, simulations. Uh, we can try and take a whole lot of these simulations at various Reynolds numbers and quantify the, the time that it takes for the out-of-plane contribution to grow relative to the in-plane contribution. So heuristically, if we define an, uh, the time at which uh, the out-of-plane contribution is 50% of the in-plane contribution, and we call that transition time T3D, uh, we can plot over time um, the out-of-plane contribution normalized by the total and the in-plane contribution normalized by the total and see how they evolve. And here I've just shifted the time axis here to be zero at the time of impact. And so you can see here that for this low Reynolds number case, we've got a large time for tr transition time. And as Reynolds number increases, this transition time decreases as you would expect. Um, it, we can repeat this, uh, this analysis for a whole number of cases. Um, and it turns out that there's, a, there's quite a lot going on in this figure on the right here. But as it turns out, um, when we get this transition time and we plot it over our wave Reynolds numbers, we see what looks like an asymptote. It looks like this transition time asymptotes off to a finite value. And if we use information about this breaking process to estimate a turbulence Reynolds number, RE lambda, it seems that there is a, it is, there's a suggestion that this uh, transition to, or like the asymptote rather, is reached at a value of RE lambda approximately equal to 100. And um, this would then correspond very strongly with the rest of the literature in turbulence uh, where there is this, uh, this mixing, this canonical mixing transition, which is identified at an RE lambda value of 100. So uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting suggestive result. And there's certainly um, a, 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 lot, a lot of uh, work to be done in understanding further the detailed evolution of this flow. So, um, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And so this helps us really understand um, better this, uh, uh, you know, this difference on, on the one hand between 2D and 3D waves, and then also these Reynolds number effects um, in, in breaking waves and, and their evolution and the evolution of the dissipation rates. Um, qualitatively, we can identify the, uh, or, or at least it seems that we can identify um, this transition to three-dimensional behavior by trying to visualize the vortical structures underneath the wave. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the Lambda 2 criterion and plotting isosurfaces of it um, underneath the wave and seeing how they evolve over time. And then at early times, we see that the isosurfaces, especially here in the bulk, they, they look quite planar, but then as the wave evolves, we see that there are these long filamentary structures that form with well-defined transverse wave numbers. And then at late times, they sort of devolve into this isotropic mess for want of a better word, but we do see um, this sort of this apparent transitional structure here. So this is suggestive of a, of a transverse instability, uh, which is taking place underneath the wave, probably uh, Reynolds number mediated, possibly slightly bond number mediated as well, but this warrants further investigation as well. So that's, um, so that's, that's uh, this transition behavior. So much for energy dissipation, but what about what about the bubbles in the spray? I mean, these simulations generate a, a lot of statistics for droplets and for bubbles in the flow. And we're very interested in understanding these statistics a little bit better. So there are some key questions that we are asking here. Uh, when and how is the spray and the, and the, and the bubbles generated in this process? Uh, numerically, what are the smallest sizes that we can hope to resolve? Uh, this is really a technical question. Um, and then also well, we want to compare well with experiment. And uh, we also want to try and understand the relationship between the bubble statistics that, uh, that we see and the evolution of the energy and the, and the dissipation rate that I've just been talking about. So the easiest way to do this, uh, the, the first place to start really with bubble statistics is we have a ton of bubbles, let's plot them. Let's plot a contour of the, of the number of bubbles that we see. So what I have here is time on the horizontal axis normalized by the wave period. And on the vertical axis, I have bubble size. I am normalizing here by the Hinze scale. The Hinze scale is the length scale for a bubble that is embedded in turbulent flow where the surface tension forces on the bubble resist the action of turbulent shear in the ambient flow. Um, and uh, so we expect that there, that there will be a qualitative change in behavior for bubbles below this size versus bubbles above this size. So that's why I normalize with a Hinze scale there. Um, and if we plot this over time, we see that very small bubbles are generated immediately on impact. And then sometime after impact, we see that larger bubbles are formed. Um, 
what is also very interesting is that if we, on top of this, we superimpose the energy dissipation rate on the secondary axis, um, we see that the shape of this contour map actually rather roughly follows the shape of the dissipation rate, which really does seem to highlight um, our understanding that the bubble statistics that we see um, are really bound up in the evolution of the energy dissipation rate. So we want to understand the size distributions a little bit better here. Let's see if we can choose, well, it's, it's a big question to choose how we, how we set a time window to average over, but for the sake of the, of, um, of, of the discussion, let's, let's say that we've, we successfully choose a time averaging window and we plot the size, the, the size distributions um, of the bubbles. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm plotting these bubble size distributions over the bubble size, again, normalized by the Hinze scale. The Hinze scale is here, 10 to, 10 to the zero. In physical flows, this corresponds to about one millimeter. So one millimeter bubbles is where the Hinze scale is. And I'm plotting my numerical data um, at a fairly low bond number um, and a variety of experimental data. Um, I just want to say that on the vertical axis, this is the, the number of bubbles that we see um, normalized appropriately. Uh, but here I'm, I'm plotting this in arbitrary units vertically so that the vertical shifting between all the, uh, the experimental data sets and the numerical data sets are uh, really done this way for convenience. So don't read too much into the vertical scaling. Um, but the horizontal scaling is identical between all of these. These are all normalized with respect to the Hinze scale. And so the first thing that we see with our numerical data, if we look above the Hinze scale, is that we get approximately this power law uh, with an exponent of minus 10 on three. So this is consistent with the predictions of theory. It's consistent with experimental data. And it is also, this exponent has also been seen previously in numerical studies. So it is expected and not too surprising that we see this exponent. Uh, but what is, uh, what is new here is that we are also extending significantly below the Hinze scale in our simulations. And we are able to get actually a, a clearly well, well, a fairly well-defined um, shape in our, uh, in our bubble size distribution, which resembles this exponent of minus three on two, uh, which is also very similar to that reported by Dean and Stokes of 2002. There is of course some variation between the experimental data, but excuse me, um, it, I'm very happy to say that our numerical data uh, matches quite well, um, certainly with Dean and Stokes and fairly well with the other experimental data that we see here. So that's very interesting. Um, there are physical arguments for seeing this minus 10 on three form based on the turbulent cascade um, uh, sort of argument that you apply to bubbles, uh, but such arguments don't really exist underneath the Hinze scale. And it's a little bit mysterious what's happening down there. Um, and we don't really have a clear answer for why this shape exists, but there might be some ways to, to help address it. So um, one thing that I did in parallel to these breaking wave simulations is that I also took a box of homogeneous isotropic turbulence and I injected a bubble of a particular size. And this bubble is characterized by the Weber number. And so the Weber number expresses the ratio of turbulent uh, forces to surface tension forces. On the, on the bubble. So large Weber numbers correspond with bigger bubbles, which are deformed more easily and break up more easily. Um, so I did a number of these different simulations. And so all these different Weber numbers gave us different statistics um, for, and I'll point out, these are all sub Hinze scale statistics on these bubble populations that we see. And we see in, in particular that the shape of these statistics, it seems to increase with the increasing size of the bubble, that is with the increasing Weber number of the bubble. And if we then superimpose on the same plot, the breaking wave data that I just have, there is certainly some, uh, some resemblance between the different simulations that we've performed. And this suggests that perhaps it is possible to synthesize the breaking wave distributions from some convolution or combination of these individual, uh, the statistics generated by individual bubble breakups, which is very encouraging. And this is uh, uh, an area of, of um, uh, the intense interest um, that, that, uh, that I want to uh, look into moving forward and is, is particularly uh, in this research group. So, so that, that's, that's interesting. That's a uh, interesting uh, forward path looking on the bubbles, but um, I just want to take one uh, a, a parenthesis, a little aside and talk a little bit about the, the pinch off processes in bubbles, because it is a fundamental um, feature of these uh, uh, breakup phenomena in these in this turbulent um, flows that there's going to 
there's going to be some questions about how the pinch off process itself actually happens uh, within the bubble breakups themselves. So in theory, there is a very well known result that when a bubble pinches off in a quiescent medium, we see this wonderful power law, um, this self similar behavior with this really well defined exponent here, and this can be reproduced very easily experimentally and numerically. What I'm doing here, by the way, is showing experimental visualizations due to Daniel Ruth, a graduate student at Princeton University. Um, and we worked together on a study led by him um, looking at this turbulent bubble pinch off process. So for reference, this is the quiescent pinch off process. The question is, how does a turbulent medium affect the pinch off process of this bubble? And the answer is, at least um, most of the time or a lot of the time, it doesn't actually seem to affect it that much. What the turbulence does is it affects the initial condition of the bubble, but then the pinch off process itself, the self-similar dynamics are still uh, achieved in the mean. There may be some uh, perturbations and uh, oscillatory behavior around that mean, but the essential behavior is still captured. And so the argument for this is quite straightforward. It's just that uh, because this is a self-similar process in time, as we approach pinch off, uh, the timescales of the pinch off dynamics become much smaller than the timescales of the turbulent motion evolution. So the turbulent flow field becomes frozen into the background and the dynamics of the self-similar uh, uh, pinch off process continue on their own as if the flow was otherwise quiescent. Unless it turns out, unless the turbulent perturbs the initial condition so much that the self-similar behavior is escaped altogether. And so this is what's happening here in this video. We see this kink that's forming in this neck um, and so this actually affects the pinch off behavior of the neck and the self similarity and the power law behavior is escaped altogether. Um, so it is possible, it turns out to have a sufficiently asymmetric bubble that will escape this classical result. Um, all you need to do is get there. And so uh, the, or, or get to that odd initial condition and turbulence is a good way to do this. But turbulence itself does not cause this kink. And one way that uh, we could show this was by running I ran a number of numerical simulations, which compared an, an, an axisymmetric bubble with an asymmetric bubble. Here we are zooming in on the neck region, an axisymmetric bubble on the left, asymmetric on the right. You can see that a clean pinch off is qualitatively attained here, but we see that a kink is obtained here from the non-axisymmetric, from the asymmetric bubble. And this is an equiescent background. So there we, we learned a little bit more about the, the bubble pinch off processes and turbulent flow. Uh, this was published in a paper in the PNAS. Um, and it's, uh, it was a really a very stimulating study. So much for the bubbles. What about the droplets? Um, we can try the same approach that we did with the bubbles with droplets. Droplets are more challenging for a number of reasons. Um, it, is, it is harder to uh, numerically resolve as many of them. We get much, much fewer droplets generated by our breaking waves than bubbles. Uh, which means that we need to go to much larger bond numbers corresponding with larger wavelengths. Um, to generate those, those droplet statistics, but of course, larger wavelengths are more difficult to resolve numerically. So it's a, a bit of a catch-22, but it turns out that we, there is a window of bond numbers that we can work with and we can plot these droplet statistics here. Um, again, I'm plotting with time on the horizontal axis here. On the vertical axis, I'm normalizing by the capillary length because when droplets are ejected into the air, it's not, not a turbulent environment in the same sense that the, water, that the liquid phase is underneath the breaker. So the Hinze scale is no longer really appropriate as the normalizing scale. So here I'm just using the capillary length scale. And then if we try plotting the energy dissipation rate over the top, you really can't make an argument that the shape of the droplets uh, uh, statistics matches that of the, or even qualitatively matches that of the uh, energy dissipation rate. And this really emphasizes that what we expect to see from our droplet statistics uh, will not really be predicted very easily by what we see in the energy dissipation underwater. And that actually makes sense if you think about it. Um, but we can still try and do our time averaging process to get a droplet statistics. And so what I'm showing you here is a comparison with uh, an experimental study. These experimental studies are quite rare, but there's a recent one from 2019 from a study at the University of Maryland. Um, and here I'm plotting numerical data for, uh, bond 500 and bond 1000. Um, so this is a smaller wavelength. This is a larger wavelength. And I want to, I'm also plotting different resolutions here. And, I want to, and I'm doing that because I want to emphasize that it turns out that at bond number of 1000, so this is a wavelength of about 40 centimeters, um, we are actually able to achieve quite roughly um, a grid convergence 
between our droplet statistics, which is a very, uh, uh, which is a, a big result um, numeric for numerical resolution of multiphase flows. And also we get a shape which looks very similar to that of the experiment. We are shifted a little bit, um, but this is a very encouraging result that we're actually getting that same, we're really closely following that, that dashed line there. Um, it is worth remarking that there are clearly bond number effects here. And Aaron et al.'s data was run at an even larger wavelength. I think theirs is, corresponds really more to a bond number of 6,000, something like that. So this uh, explains part of the data shifts here. But we do otherwise have very good qualitative agreement with the experiments. So this is very, uh, very encouraging again, um, as uh, we are able to achieve higher and higher resolutions with this kind of, um, these kinds of simulations. We hope to get, um, get better and better agreement and continue to show grid convergence and then hopefully come up with a good set of uh, spray generation functions or really just physical arguments that can explain uh, these slopes. So that actually concludes the main results that I wanted to show you today. I'll um, just conclude briefly, I'll remind you that I showed you some work on the energy dissipation underneath breakers in, in deep water and in shallow water. Um, in particular, I, I developed a model that, um, that could function as a predictive model for uh, dissipation rate in shallow water. We discussed the transition to three-dimensional dissipation in, in deep water waves, at least, in particular as a function of Reynolds number. And we discussed bubble and droplet statistics and showed a good agreement with experiment and um, very, uh, very nice, uh, very encouraging data uh, with regard to numerical resolution. Of course, there's a wealth of, of problems that we can still address. One thing that I'm very interested in in particular is Lagrangian transport in the subsurface. So what I have here on the right is a video generated through Basilisk uh, where I've got a breaking wave, but I've removed the surface of the wave. Instead, we're seeing these clouds of particles which are tracked in the Lagrangian way underneath the surface. Uh, the coloring is just for visual labeling. Uh, but then as you see, as the wave develops and it breaks, you can see that these particles are transported um, within the liquid phase. And you can see some mixing, especially in the transverse direction, uh, appearing. And if you if you fool yourself a little bit, maybe you can identify some transverse wave numbers. Um, certainly, this seems like an interesting way to to um, uh, look, say, for example, at Lagrangian coherent structures in the in the flow underneath the wave, which may help us better understand uh, that transition um, and that instability that I described to you earlier in the talk. And of course, it's also uh, could be very useful for discussing questions like sediment transport in coastal environments. Um, so that, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much for sticking through it. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Voda. So uh, uh, for an interesting and uh, comprehensive presentation on a very difficult uh, topic, I'm sure the audience is uh, 